So hello, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Kelly Neerick. I'm the Senior Director of Products and Services for the Small Business Association of Michigan. And in the summer of 2021, SPAM teamed up with Transamerica and Greystone Consulting, Farmington Hills, a business of Morgan Stanley, to launch an exclusive pulled employer retirement plan for our small business members. And our program is a perfect example of how our influence and strength in numbers brings together um, a, a team uh, led by top experts in the industry that most small businesses um, wouldn't be able to take advantage of on their own. Um, our program gives you exclusive cost savings and simplifies administration tasks while reducing your financial um, liability. And I encourage you to visit our website at sbam.org slash retirement to learn more about that program and um, how it can benefit you. So joining us today is um, a representative from Greystone Consulting and John Rogers as well as uh, a guest speaker, the Senior Retirement Strategist at Capital Group, um, Sue Walton. So today, um, they'll be reviewing the four key changes within the SECURE Act 2.0. Um, the SECURE Act 2.0 is a significant piece of retirement legislation that went into effect last year. Um, it is impacting retirement savings that's intended to make it easier for small businesses to offer retirement plans and for the individuals who are participating to save more money for their retirement. Uh, you are currently muted. Uh, however, we do encourage you to use the chat or Q&A feature as we go along. And then at the end of the presentation, we can open it up for questions. So I will now turn it over to John Rogers um, to get us started. So thank you, John. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, I'm John Rogers. I'm an institutional consultant with Greystone. Um, which is Morgan Stanley's institutional wealth management business. And we have a, a, an expertise in working with um, corporate retirement plans. Uh, and we worked with SBAM to build the SBAM PEP. But today, um, we're going to zoom out a little bit and talk about some of the benefits that are available to small business owners as a result of the SECURE Act tax credits um, uh, that was passed um, multiple year kind of legislation, the, the SECURE Act, um, a lot of changes to, to retirement um, and the way retirement savings will be structured for small businesses going forward. Um, and Sue is an expert in, in retirement strategies um, from Capital Group. And many of you are probably familiar with Capital Group as the parent company of the American Funds. Um, and so if you do, you know, take a hard look at the SBAM PEP at any point, um, you'll see that they are the, the target retirement date strategies on that fund or on that fund menu um, and, and have a really long track record uh, in the retirement space in particular. So Sue's going to talk today uh, and share a presentation uh, about, you know, really practical things that, that you can take back, um, take a look at your existing retirement plan and, and ways you might be able to enhance it. Um, or if you haven't started a retirement plan before, it's really never been a better time um, to, to do so because uh, the government's made it so attractive with, with these tax credits. So uh, I'll let Sue take it away from here. And, and as Kelly said, if there are any questions, I'll monitor the chat while she's talking and, and we'll, at, we'll answer them in, in, in real time. Um, but uh, Sue, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of the conversation. Uh, incredible and great work that you're doing there in Michigan in terms of what you've set up and structured. And uh, as you know, John said, we did want to share some thoughts on what we're seeing with regard to Secure 2.0, uh, the opportunities that really are being created today as part of this legislation, in particular for small businesses. But we'd be remiss if we didn't kind of take a step back. I mean, I love the, the phrase, let's zoom out a little bit, because we've been talking about pension legislation for a number of years, and certainly the last big major uh, pension legislation that had an impact on these plans was back in 2006 with the Pension Protection Act. Secure 1.0, setting every community up for retirement enhancement, uh, was a couple years back and started the conversation in terms of key areas we wanted to be able to focus on, encouraging coverage, higher savings, access, more flexibility. 
certainly clarification from a from a lifetime income perspective. So this focus on what happens in a post-retirement environment. And as we saw as part of Secure 1.0, this extension out of the required minimum distribution age. Now we know we were building on Secure 1.0 with 2.0, hence the name, uh, but wanted to continue that idea in terms of boosting retirement savings. A number one, as John alluded to, significant expansion of the startup tax credits to encourage more plan starting. Now this comes in, you know, in a time frame when we are seeing across the board a number of state mandates and opportunities where we are, you know, focused on the majority of the states have already started some legislation, if not conversations, about what to do in terms of creating more access, but more to come on that in terms of how that is more the the stick versus the carrot in, in setting up these plans. And we would say that the expansion of the tax credits really acts as that carrot in terms of encouraging uh, plan sponsors to be able to start these plans and removing one of the greatest barriers, which for many had been cost. Uh, so if you think about the cost being one of them, the second being administration and complexity, and we go back to SBAM in terms of the PEP that's been created to try to um, really take advantage of those opportunities, the efficiencies created when people are coming together. Uh, so certainly from that standpoint, removing a number of the objections, if you will, in terms of why people don't have plans today. And certainly as we think about how to enhance those plans, these key ideas that we can take back in thinking about the plans that we have today, plan enhancements, including things like student loan repayment, emergency savings accounts, uh, emergency withdrawals, having better, fle more flexible access to the to the assets, and then expanding out this idea around, you know, further extending the required minimum distribution age, keeping participants in plan longer, which is a consistent trend that we saw uh, already before this legislation in terms of people staying in plan. And this really gives also what we're calling rothification of some of these uh, programs as well. So just thinking about what is an objective here and how we are you know, moving these plans along, as John alluded to, this is a multi-year rollout, a lot of complexity. So certainly 92 uh, provisions outlining it, over 300 pages of legislation. How do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. And in this regard, how do we prioritize some of the things we're thinking about? It's really based on timing. Now. There is a recognition that with the 92 provisions and a lot of complexities, there are some mandatory things, some optional things, uh, and certainly plan sponsor level versus participant level opportunities. So how do you kind of think about prioritizing the ideas around that? We did it based on a timeline. If we think 2023, what's happening in this year? Almost over if we think about it in that way, but the opportunity from the tax credits the relaxed minimum distribution uh, age in terms of those rules, the opportunity to do Roth employer contributions. And, you know, certainly we'll put an asterisk on that uh, in making sure that administratively that we have the ability to, to accommodate those kinds of things. And certainly Roth for both simple and SEP IRAs. Now, if we think about what's happening in, in the next year, we've already had some adjustments. And I can, you know, if I was revising this slide today, I would take that second comment required Roth treatment of catch-up contributions. And I'd move that to a new column in 2026 uh, with a recognition that from an administrative standpoint, there are some challenges both on payroll as well as from a record keeper standpoint in being able to accommodate uh, that required uh, opportunity. So for those earning more than $145,000, the catch-up contributions become Roth. And now we've outlined that for 2026, not 2024. So already a revision on these slides. But certainly from that standpoint, if we think about financial wellness, we think about the generations that we have in the workforce today, things like student loan repayment match. How do we get people participating fully, getting into the program, what was holding them back? Maybe some of those financial decisions, those hard financial decisions that people were making, saying, I can't participate in the program because I am sidled with so much student debt. This 
it gives an opportunity to formalize a program that we had already seen from Abbott Labs a number of years back with their private letter ruling and allowing for this kind of opportunity and provision. Uh, and certainly tax and penalty free rollovers from 529 plans into Roth IRAs, certainly from a personal level. So from at that participant level, an opportunity there as well. And if we think about what's, you know, thinking beyond 2025, increased catch-up contribution opportunities, uh, they've added some additional flexibility or, or complications in terms of what age ranges that's happening, uh, but more to come in terms of how we're going to administer that. This idea around a retirement savings lost and found that the Department of Labor is creating, uh, and certainly the, sa the savers tax credit becomes now a government match. So to the extent you've got, you know, folks in your workforce that are lower earners, if you will, that this is an incredible opportunity to encourage more savings and have the opportunity to get that savers match as well. And as we have talked about um, with regard to access and enhancing plans in 2025, all new plans that were started or initiated after 1-1 of 2023 automatic enrollment and escalation will be required. Now, we didn't get a federal mandate, but it certainly does create the opportunity to have a conversation. Does this now set a new bar, if you will, in terms of what we wanna be focused on from a plan design perspective? Um, so for those who are not doing auto enrollment today, is there some encouragement, if you will, to try to implement these kinds of strategies within the plan? from a plan design perspective to encourage and enhance what we're seeing from a participant outcomes perspective. Uh, so if we think about that in terms of very specifically those, uh, those tax credits, because we think if we think carrot mandates, state mandates, considering that across the board, uh, states like Oregon, California, Illinois are much further ahead in the game in terms of their requirement for small businesses to be offering. Uh, these kinds of plans. And if you're not offering it directly, do you have the the opportunity to uh, to go ahead and, and be initiated into some state-run program? Uh, if we think about that in the context of those objections that we had, uh, certainly fees and the costs of starting these plans would be one of them. The second would be the administration, the burden of administration. And if we think in combination, you've got this great program from a, sta a startup tax credit standpoint, as well as uh, programs like SBAM's PEP, that's creating those efficiencies, creating opportunities to buying power as folks are coming together and, and having that from an administrative standpoint, that these are definitely benefits uh, with regard to what we're, we're looking at here today. So if we take a closer look at what those tax credits look like here, uh, certainly, no, you know, from a requirement standpoint, what requirements must businesses meet to qualify? So no more than 100 employees. So small plans, for sure, who receive compensation of 5,000 or more in the preceding year. And the employer hasn't offered a plan covering substantially the same employees during those previous three tax years. So that's how you qualify for these tax credits. Now, from the tax credit in and of itself, it's a decreasing percentage of the amount contributed by the employer uh, for each employee. So for no more than $100,000 per year, up to $1,000 annually per employee. Uh, and that's over the plan's first five years. So some very specific details. We will be providing this document um, to you as well. So you have it direct in hand. Uh, and thinking about what different, you know, plan sizes that might apply and to, to that as well. Contribution tax credit applies for DC plans, 401k, SEP, simples, again, no more than 100 employees. And from a credit percentage with fewer, with 50 or fewer employees, it phases down over five years. So at year one, it's 100% uh, in terms of uh, that schedule that we see outlined there in the middle of the page. Year two, 100%. Year three, it drops down to 75%. Year five, 50%. And then in year five, 25%. And that's the percentage that's applied uh, to the employer contributions to determine what the tax credit might look like. So you've got both from an expense standpoint, the coverage, as well as the employer contribution 
coverage in terms of these tax credits. And we'll use some very specific examples in terms of what that looks like, what that might mean. Uh, and we have, you know, from an you know, from Secure 1.0 to 2.0, we did see that increased coverage. So previously, the tax credit covered 50% of eligible employee plan costs. Secure 2.0 increases that to 100% of eligible costs for employees, I'm sorry, employers with 50 or fewer employees. So really focused in on that small end of the, the spectrum from a, a business standpoint to allow for more flexibility in the implementation. So what, are, what kinds of costs are covered? Certainly from that standpoint, the setup as well as the administration of the plan and included in that financial uh, professionals and TPA compensation, record keeping fees and employee education expenses are also included. The credit does not uh, apply to plan costs paid through plan assets. So if we're utilizing revenue sharing, this is where we would not have those offsets. These are direct costs that are outlined from a plan perspective. Um, and in different types of plans, you can see there are opportunities here in terms of how different share classes might be represented. And then what else you need to know from a credit standpoint? We know it's been expanded through Secure 2.0, and this is for plan years beginning after 2022, so starting 1-1-23. Contribution credit and cost credit uh, are separate and distinct. So plans may receive one or both of those credits. And if a plan terminates after receiving tax credit, repayment of the credits is not required. So that gives you a really specific rundown uh, outlining a lot of different opportunities. We will share uh, this document as well because I think it really gives you a nice framework to, to start to consider You know what might be holding you back, what are the opportunities that exist, uh, but we would readily admit that there is, you know, certainly from a secure 2.0 standpoint, a lot to take on, a multi-year implementation, a lot of, uh, you know, details, red tape to kind of get through, as well as the support from an administration, an administrative perspective as well. Um, I think what we have seen as we start prioritizing, you know, where do we want to focus our time? It's certainly one, do we have a plan or not? What are our opportunities? Do we want to do it ourselves? Can we take advantage of these tax credits from an administration standpoint? Do we want to do it ourselves? Do we want to combine uh, with some efficiencies that are available out there in the marketplace? That's a great starting point. But then once we have a plan, we've already got a plan established, what are the ways that we can start enhancing those outcomes from a participant standpoint? Taking advantage of the plan design features, if we think about those uh, mandatory auto features that are coming down the pike in terms of 2025, does that give us an opportunity to reevaluate what we're doing today? Uh, certainly from an auto enrollment perspective, we've recently conducted an institutional plan sponsor survey. Uh, certainly from that contribution level, the auto, uh, auto enrollment, six is the new three. So creating, you know, with the expectation that the opt-out rates are the same, if we want to get people saving, saving more, saving faster with a recognition that we know uh, that folks are going to need more in retirement. It's no longer that that 10 percent that's going to keep us safe. Uh, we've seen ranges from 12 to 15 percent and even higher if we tar start to take into consideration uh, health care costs into retirement. That maybe 18 to 20 percent becomes that new deferral rate between a combination of my contributions, my employer contributions, that that might give me a much more secure uh, retirement, if you will. So really trying to take advantage of the opportunities that exist. And those other plan features, if we start nibbling away at, you know, more of those financial wellness kinds of ideas, emergency savings, student loan repayment, uh, these kinds of things that might pair nicely with attracting, retaining, and certainly retiring our participants out of our system, out of our workforce. Uh, we know that these are very highly visible benefits. So in a you know highly competitive workforce today that we know attracting and retaining, this is certainly a great opportunity to highlight uh, a benefit that, that folks are looking for. In some industries, it's table stakes, and how do we make sure that we can enhance that we would suggest from a plan sponsor's perspective, as John said, 
some key takeaways on how we enhance these plans, understanding participant demographics, really evaluating who is in your workforce today. Is it from a generational standpoint, do I have folks that are nearing retirement and into, you know, getting into retirement? Are they staying in the plan? And would that then, you know, open the door for some consideration around thinking about retirement income, as an example, if we go back to Secure 1.0 and the focus that we had there. And certainly, if we think about how do I prioritize some of those other optional features, understanding my demographics, it, do I have a, a, a large portion of millennials or Gen Zs coming into my workforce that also have that concern around student loan repayment? And are there some opportunities there? So I will pause with my formal comments there. I think we said a lot in a short amount of time, uh, but give you some you know, food for thought and would love to open it up. John, do we have any questions in the chat? Um, and maybe folks wanna take the opportunity now to ask a question. Yeah, no questions in the chat, Sue, but that, thanks for all that that information. And it looks like Kelly's letting everybody in. So um, if you wanna ask your questions live, um, you can go ahead and take yourself off mute and do that. Um, you know, while everybody's kind of entering into the room, I'll mention, you know, some of the startup costs that uh, Sue mentioned, um, the tax credit for, for new retirement plans um, and the SBAM PEP, um, complete, it completely covers the startup costs um, for, for administration. Um, so I think that's a really unique thing. A lot of times this was cost prohibitive for small businesses. Every time they looked at a retirement plan, it seemed like there was going to be a lot of out-of-pocket expense. Um, but the government has really made it easier um, by providing these tax credits to, to get on to the, the, the 401k train and, and get things rolling. So um, everybody's in the room. Kelly, um, everybody off mute if they want to ask any questions. Yeah, yeah, please um, speak freely if you have any questions, or again, you can use the chat or Q&A feature. We'll give it a couple seconds. Okay, it looks like everybody's pretty clear with the information that we shared. Um, again, we will be posting this webinar on our website and also the information that Sue has shared. And if you have any questions at all, um, my contact information is on that page. Again, it's um, sbam.org slash retirement. Oh, we do have one question that popped in. Oh, just a thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, thank you. And if you have any questions at all going forward, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you to Sue and John for your time. We appreciate your expertise. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Take care. Thanks. Thank Sue. you so much. Bye-bye.